This is one of those Sundays where we have featured a gospel reading that basically has too much to preach on. It is a litany of very popular and well-known cliches. And it's often amusing at times in hearing people refer to some of these passages, the times in which, I suppose, more often than not, they are misquoted. For example, many, many years ago, I was on a bus between here and Vallejo, and one of the passengers was talking rather loudly, but jovially, friendly to the bus driver. I guess they knew each other. I forget the exact context of what they were talking about, but obviously interacting with different people. And the passenger at one point said, well, you know what the Bible says, do to others as they do to you. Which, by the way, is not what the Bible says. It's do to others as you would have them do to you, but he, you know, he knows the Bible. He quoted it as if he was some kind of an expert. Another favorite misquote, if there's anything people nowadays especially know about the gospel or the whole Bible in general, is that it tells us to do two things, both of which are in today's gospel. Don't judge and love. I mean, isn't that great? I mean, this is just excerpts of the Bible. And look how many pages it is. The Bible, in most cases, you can see is this thick, depending on what edition we're looking at. But all we need to do is just erase everything else in the Bible, because all it tells us to do is to love and to not judge. Unfortunately, people understand don't judge in terms of don't ever be critical or disapproving of anyone for anything ever, any time. But they forget it's not simply never be critical or never be disapproving. If I had a nickel for every time someone came to confession and said, I judge people, I wouldn't need to be in this job. But the full context is in human interactions with each other in which we are to avoid the judgment of condemnation. Stop judging and you will not be judged. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. It's not simply don't judge, but we've become so conditioned in our misunderstanding of that passage that we think it's a sin even to disapprove of something and even be critical of something. If that's the case, then Martin Luther King Jr. was the biggest sinner in the world because he was highly critical of many, many things. The prophets are all in hell because they were highly critical of many, many things. But that's another example of popular Bible cliches that people love to throw around without necessarily knowing what's behind them. But the passage I wish people would pay more attention to is the passage time and time again. Jesus repeats it almost in a litany. Three examples in which he's basically telling us to stand out. Don't do what everyone else is doing. We often hear critics of the Catholic Church or Catholic teaching as being out of line with the mainstream, not in line with popular opinion. And I think to a certain degree to our own shame, one of those arguments would be, well, the church should change that teaching because most Catholics don't follow it anyway. Sometimes even saying most Catholics don't follow it. But Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what's the big deal? Sinners do that. If you lend to those who would pay you back, what credit is that to you? Sinners lend to sinners. Sinners love those who love them. In other words, he tells us to be different, to stand out in how different we are. So when people were to say either to me or to other people I know, well, why doesn't the church change this teaching? No one follows it anyway. That's not in line with majority opinion. We could answer in the same way Jesus does. Why would we do what everyone else does? We're Catholics. We're Christians. We're followers of Christ. Why would we follow majority opinion? We follow Christ. Let everyone else follow majority opinion. Let everyone else get with the times. 
This is what we do as a people of faith. But how often do we think in those terms as how we conduct ourselves as a people of faith? It's not that we have to do something, it's we're Catholic. This is what we do. It's not that we can't do something. We're Christians, we're followers of Christ. We don't do that. We don't do what everyone else does. We do what Christ tells us to do. That's been a major theme of my preaching over the last couple of years during the pandemic. Some of you might have heard me say it, that we as Catholics cannot and should not allow ourselves to be caught up in the frenzy and hysterics that was so pushed and advocated by our leaders and by our media over the last few years. We cannot allow ourselves to get caught up in a general panic. Keep our faith in God, keep an even keel. Let's not get up, caught up in the frenzy. We don't do that as Catholic people. Unfortunately, I was wrong. In no way did we stand out, nor do we stand out now during this pandemic. And now that it's waning and we see plenty of places throughout the world, even in our own country, putting aside mandates, putting aside the fear, how well do we stand out in that process as well? We're not. But there is another group that has been. We don't hear too much about them, but I saw an article about them on the internet, of the Amish communities, east, obviously, the east part of the United States. When the virus started spreading and everyone was being told, put on the mask, get the vaccine, do what everyone else is doing, they didn't. They continued to interact. They got sick, obviously, they stayed home but they continued to live their lives. Yes, they took their precautions, but they didn't get caught up in the frenzy. And yes, the virus spread. Yes, some of them got sick. And yes, a few of them died. And they said, that's life. In this interview that I watched with a couple of their elders and their leaders, they were asked, why didn't you do what we told you to do? Why didn't you follow your political leaders? Why didn't you do what the news told you to do, forgetting that they really don't have TVs or radio? They just simply said, that's not who we are. That's not what we do. And they were among the first communities to really move on from the virus because of general immunity that developed among them. They didn't fall into fear and panic. I wish Catholics could say the same. Now, in the last week, in the state of California, and as we no doubt heard before Mass today, the indoor mask mandates are now no longer in place, and that masks are optional. And as we look around even this morning, and as last night's presider pointed out over dinner in the rectory, not one in this church took off the mask. Not one would exercise a certain degree of courage and confidence. And perhaps it will be a process, a long process, for us to get out of what we've been conditioned to feel and think. But perhaps one motivation we can be given is in today's gospel. We are Catholics. We are Christians. We don't do that. We don't do what everyone else does. We don't panic like everyone else does. We don't remain in fear like everyone else does. We're not compulsive people like everyone else is. And as we know, it may take some time to get back to the comfort, but let's also look at it in the spiritual sense as well. This isn't a matter of mask shaming or not mask shaming or vax shaming or not vax shaming. What is our disposition as we go forward from here, spiritually, spiritually? Do we continue to go forward with a mentality, we might get sick? 
Or do we go forward with a feeling of health and a confidence in health? We spent the last two years with sickness on our minds. Let us work in this process of getting health back into our hearts so that we can be leaders in a society returning to a mentality of health rather than a fear and compulsion based on sickness. And a good opportunity for that begins in just a couple of weeks. Just a couple of weeks, we begin the season of Lent, a time of growth, a time of conversion, a time of penance, a time of discipline. Perhaps that could be an honorable goal for the season of Lent, in which we say, by the time we get to the celebration of the resurrection, we will act like people of the resurrection. Regardless of where the rest of society is and their mentality of sickness and death and avoiding all that, we will come to Easter with a sense of resurrection, freedom, and health in mind and in body. And let us, little by little, work our way out of the mask anonymity that we have been living in, in our faceless society that has lived in such fear over the last couple of years. Why would we do that? That's what everyone else does. But we listen to Christ. We have the confidence of people who are saved. We do not fear an invisible force because it could kill us. We follow that invisible spirit because it gives us life. That's who we are as a people of faith. Let us grow to that, if not right away, working our way back to that in this upcoming season of Lent. Why would we do otherwise? That's what everyone else does. Let us stand out as people of faith, people of courage, people with faces, smiles, expressions, people who follow Christ.